Chase Mackey with the Outer Circle, and today I um, thought I'd look at something a little bit different. Um, recently, I've been doing more videos on the uh, What Break the Fan series, um, where we cover like different codexes that have been just very underloved and underappreciated. And a central point that keeps coming up often is that certain phases or certain aspects about the core gameplay itself um, are greatly affecting the codex um, as much as any poor rules within it. And uh, because of that, and with the rumours of 8th edition coming up, I thought I'd actually do a video where I lay out in a very mature and basic way uh, the key problems that I'm seeing with 40k at the moment and what I think needs to actually be fixed with it. So how would I fix 8th edition? Well, to do this I'm going to break it down into dot points and then I'll expand on each of them later. Firstly, clear, concise rules with as little in the way of interpretation as possible. Removal of formations and detachments currently in existence in favour of revamping them. The rewriting of numerous codexes uh, at once in order to equal the playing field. Missions written with the objective of balanced gameplay, which doesn't favour any one faction, um, as well as missions that are just for fun, i.e. Unbound uh, Beer and Pretzels games. Simplification and or removal of the current psychic phase. And lastly, a rejigging of the Gargantua Monstrous Creature, Monstrous Creature and Walker rules in general. So, let's go into each of these one by one. I'll try to keep it brief, um, and where I can, I'll try and provide examples of why the current system isn't working and how it can be fixed. So, clear and concise rules. Currently in 40k there are a lot of really poorly worded and or ambiguous rules, um, often not helped by the wording which can lead to confusion or outright misconception. For example, there is a current line in the 40k 7th Eterata where, I'm paraphrasing here, Walkers and super heavy walkers or vehicles, weapons have a 45 degree arc unless the weapon is modelled otherwise. Well, now while this may seem pretty simple, the statement unless modelled otherwise is a big problem here. Because me personally, I take it to mean unless the kit we have supplied or sculpted allows the weapon to traverse further than 45. But here's the but. And it's a big but. A power game or win at all cost player might assume that that means uh, if they model or convert their miniatures in such a way that allows them to exceed um, the original design, then it's improved because it's now modelled otherwise. An example might be mounting a demolisher cannon into a predator turret so that it now has a 360 degree firing arc. It's modelled otherwise. Now, that's modelling for advantage, one might say, but as per the uh, description, it's been modelled otherwise, which is allowed. I would suggest looking to other gaming systems in order to see how clear-cut rules are written, even to older games such as the Lord of the Rings and Hobbit games that were themselves made by Games Workshop, um, and see how cut and dry a lot of the rules are actually written, and how it's very hard to be too ambiguous with them. Removal of formations and detachments. Currently, they're absolutely up a certain dark hued creek without a paddle. Formations are inconsistent with the amount of bonuses they provide a faction, often providing rules that are, are far removed from accepted rules in the basic rulebook, such as allowing charges from reserve, no fire and move penalty for heavy weapons, or even Jacurian, uh, Decurian, I should say, shenanigans with formation stacks that somehow count as battleforged. No, no, no. Future formations should provide the core of an army. Basically, troops and a HQ option. And it would make construction of lists easier by not having to individually repeat the troop tax calculations with every list. We all do it. You sit there and you plug in, alright, you know, one tactical squad, oh yeah, plus five marines, 15 points of pop, yep, yeah, now plus, you know, this special weapon, plus this. You see, you have to do that for every time you make a list. Well, a good formation would remove the need to do that. It would provide you with the bare essentials to play, and it would be great for new people getting into the hobby because they can go out, buy a let's start playing list. You know, two tactical squads and a chaplain, for example, could be the list. Right? 
they go out, they don't need to dick around making an army list, because new people to the hobby won't have programs like Army Builder or things like that. Um, they go out, get the formation, all comes in the box, all the rules they need to play that army is in the box. It's that simple. Detachments um, and formations as well uh, should not be a pay-to-win or a pay-to-play tactic for Games Workshop as they are now, where the rules are often only included in the box. Um, this is not DLC like computer games. We don't want to go down that path either. Detachments themselves need to be used as supplement codexes um, with new miniatures and their rules um, used as a platform for selling new rules for existing units to make them slightly more um, sorry, I should wear that better. At the moment, detachments are often used to, like a help brute formation and detachment, right? It's, it's used to give an existing unit different rules, that if you pay the money for the rules, you'll get a better version of an existing unit. And that is not how detachments should work. T detachments should be um, introducing a new miniature. So once you have... A codex established, right? And it's not going to get updated for several years. You bring out new sculpts and new units to add to it. That is the appropriate use of a detachment, right? Or a data slate, I should say. So you would use your data slate detachment to add this unit into your um, codex. As opposed to an existing unit with buffed rules, some description, because that's basically becoming a pay to win. Rewriting codexes uh, en masse. This is a simple fix. When writing the new edition, once the basic rulebook rules are actually locked down, you need to play test numerous codexes all at once and adjust each of them incrementally um, using a group of play testers, some of whom do want to break the game. Because this will ensure that the books don't suffer from immense power creep and are roughly analogous to one another. Uh, some would argue that releasing a new edition all at once is a bad thing as it's too steep a learning curve. I personally would counter this by saying that a balanced edition, which is consequently long-legged and long-lived, um, is of greater benefit to the player base as once you're over the initial learning hurdle, it won't have much change, apart from you know new detachments, data slates, that kind of thing being introduced along the way. Um... Obviously, you'll have to learn rules for the new data slates, but is that so bad? After all, if you, if you memorize like 7th edition now, with numerous rules, formations, data slates, all their hidden intricacies, surely you'll figure out a new edition if each of the books has just had a subtle tweak of points adjustments and things like that. Surely. Alright. Missions themselves, and I think this is a big one here, and I do provide an example so people understand where I'm going, but missions need to be broken up into a competitive and casual, um, or at least structured and casual. This is because right now there are missions in the BRB, but there's also mission cards for each faction, random mission cards, um, all this sort of thing that, you know, um, tactical objectives, summer supremacy, who cares, right? Who cares? They're often poorly written um, and add too many additional parts to the 40k machine and is constantly failing it up. We've added so many things with 6th and 7th edition that um, we need to rein it in a little. Mission cards, in my opinion, are terrible concepts because they often have meandering or unattainable goals. And For example, if you're a tower player and you have to win an assault with your battle suits, you might raise an eyebrow. Same thing if you're playing a really slow pointing guard artillery line and all of a sudden you have to send units running to objectives forward and backwards across the board. It doesn't make sense. Cut away the cards as they exist now and introduce a series of cards if you must with objectives that the player can choose for their army. That way they can tailor the objectives to something more manageable. Now, people might think that that is making it too easy. I would beg to differ because that sort of thing already exists in another form in the Horus Heresy where the Knight's Errant list can choose an Oath of Moment um, and gain various victory points, um, bonuses, for accomplishing a selected secondary. Now, they aren't easy to achieve either. 
They include things such as killing an enemy warlord in a challenge, or even killing a Primarch in close combat with your character, which is, if you're not another Primarch, very hard to do. But this, to me, makes far more sense than existing card-based missions, um, especially where a game can be won or lost on first turn um, card draw. Because, anecdotally, I drew a really good hand against a Mechanicum player oh, about a year and a half ago now, um, playing 30k. Uh, we were using the tactical objectives, and my card was, I got just kissed on the dick by the cards. I captured multiple objectives in my deployment zone on turn one. Three objectives, I believe it was. Um, killed his knight in turn one, which got me plus d6 victory points, and I had an 11-0 lead in turn one. How is that balanced? This was at a competition as well. Now, Further to this, casual missions or narrative missions. These would be such as those present in the Forge World campaign books, and they should be introduced where the requirements are quite simple and conducive to gamers, people who might not want to play complicated games, or who are new to the hobby and easily intimidated by the scale of it. These would be simple things like who kills the most units in the other person's army, who has the most units in the other person's deployment zone. Simple, basic objectives. Simple deployment types. Alright, next thing along, the psychic phase. As it stands, it has to go. We need to limit the sheer multitude of disciplines, and at the same time we just need to go back to the old 4th ed system of purchasing powers effective with your army. We need to remove the Nova, which fire and beam junk, as it's simply further complicating matters. Uh, no, I don't think Deny the Witch should be a thing for non-psychers or non-warded units. Just because someone is using the abilities they paid for, does not mean you get a free counter to it. You don't get a free counter against an enemy artillery strike, so why are psychic powers any different? After all, the psyker is usually an expensive unit, more so than the sum of its parts in many cases, and it's designed to be an effective unit, not the random jumble it is now. You can actually watch my video on the psychic phase um, if there is any confusion as to the problems with it, but believe me, they are numerous. Further to this, psychic powers need to be limited in scope, not a game-changing ability. The sheer fuckery of invisibility, for example, compared to the lackluster powers in Pyromancy, did not go unnoticed. Keep the powers small in scope, keep them simple. Keep the more powerful powers um, to level 3 and 4 master psychers, right? Don't go handing out invisibility to mastery 2 psychers and things like that. Not that invisibility should really be there, in my opinion. At least as it is written. Last point to make. Monstrous creatures, gargantuan monstrous creatures, and walkers. There is a disproportionate level of power here on display, with monstrous creatures and gargantuan monstrous creatures clearly being superior to the walker in every situation currently. I would suggest a look into the Contempt of Rules in 30k, where walkers are viable, and look to the reasons why they're viable. At which are basically, its armor isn't total junk, a basic involve save on a platform that can dish out punishment, um, it has the ability to, com um, to compete with fleet to assist it in assault moves, um, things like that, right? Bring it back into the realm of usable, because it now has an armor save of sorts. It is tough enough to not get taken down by crack grenades in close combat, even though you'll only be throwing one, apparently. On top of this, existing monstrous creatures, and clearly there are a lot that are not truly monstrous creatures, need to be reclassified. I think basically anything where the pilot isn't like permanently um, plumbed in to the unit, um, you know, like a dreadnought, anything, like a dreadnought to me is more of a monstrous creature than many monstrous creatures, because most monstrous creatures coming out now, Wraith Knights, Riptides, Dread Knights, are all piloted vessels, and they're no different realistically to a Dreadnought, but at least the Dreadnought has a synaptic link, you know, the pilot feels the vehicle as part of himself. These other vehicles don't do that, you know, the Wraith Knight has a pilot, you know, and that pilot is able to get out of the vehicle even though he loves his twin and that weird fluff. Riptides. I mean, how 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 is it any different to a tank? 
you know, I, I, it blows my mind. Further to this, vehicle penetration tables need some rejigging. Right now, they're not in a good place. If you we if we went back to maybe 5th edition with hull points, um, it's probably a really good place to be. Um, I would suggest, however, an increase in hull points on vehicles in order to stop the blatant rhino hunting and that goes on for first biting games. Um, because frankly, I think that you could almost double the hull points on vehicles and you wouldn't really affect the game for the worse by doing it. You know, four, glan four glances at the moment will slaughter a land raider and it's pretty easy to do you know especially if you're firing graviton weapons and things like that that have the haywire special rule uh, at least in 30k i know 40k graviton is quite a bit different um it's very easy to knock three hull points off a rhino four hull points off a land raider or two hull points off some of the weaker units in many cases the units have more weapons for example um, if, if you're rolling weapon destroyed, have more weapons than they have hull points. It's ludicrous. So you can literally blow off weapon destroyed, weapon destroyed, weapon destroyed, and the vehicle will be dead and still have guns. So, <laughs> very silly, in my opinion. These are the main points overall that I feel need focusing on in the current game, and is what I feel needs to be resolved in any new edition in order to fix the sprawling mass that is 40k. I don't want to see the game get the Age of Sigma treatment um, where it's just run into the ground with absolutely radical changes in rules simply just these key aspects I've spoken about I think are where we need to focus our attention innovation for innovation's sake is a terrible idea just look at the psychic phase um, also extreme changes are a terrible thing so don't seesaw from one end of the spectrum to the other keep it simple stupid uh, thanks very much for watching the video guys uh, if you have any opinions of your own on the matter and what you think needs to be changed um, Please give it to me in the comments below. I don't care if you're not civil to be honest. I would prefer if you were though um, because It's easier to sort through when people are to the point um, Not you know just saying GW you're a bunch of idiots or why are you hating on GW or whatever just You're all adults give me your opinions what have I got right? What have I got wrong? What do you think would be a better move? Thanks very much for watching the video, and I'll see you all next time.